Hey everyone, today I just want to make a quick video on how to collect some very basic data using PineScript in TradingView. It should be fairly quick. Uh, I think I'm going to show kind of like a beginner version of what I think that could look like, followed up by um, an intermediate way of doing things where you could get a little more complex just to give you some ideas of, you know, how you can collect data in TradingView and apply it to your trading. But the very first thing I'm going to do just to get us comfortable with actually um, keeping some counters and, and collecting data that way is just to make a simple day counter. So basically for every daily session that we have on a chart, we want to count that. And then we just want to display that in a table to see how many days we have on our current chart. So I just opened a new indicator here. Hopefully that's big enough to see. I was going to call this basic data for YouTube. I'm going to copy that for the short title and then declare this as true so we can plot things on our chart. You can see that this third parameter is overlay. That's the one I set to true, which basically means that we're going to be able to plot data on top of our price chart instead of it being on some lower panel. We're just going to delete this line that it automatically made for us. And so the first thing I'm going to do is just declare this count variable and set it to zero. And if I hover over this var keyword, you can see that it's used for assigning and one time initializing of the variable. So what this basically means is that on the very first bar of the chart, this is being set to zero and it's not being reset after that point. If you compared this to declaring it like this, without the var keyword, this would mean that on every bar account is getting set to zero and you're probably and you're probably manipulating the value later on. But when I'm doing a lot of data collection, I'm using this var keyword very often just to make sure that I'm keeping my counters clean and they're not getting reset on every bar. So this count variable is basically what I'm gonna use to count our days. And in TradingView, this is really easy to check. When you have a new day, you can just say if time frame dot change i'm going to pass in a string of d because that denotes the one day time frame which you could also do 1d but i'm just going to do d so if that is true and our time frames did change then i'm just going to increase this so if that is true and our time frames did change then i'm going to increase count by one so i can do count plus equals one and just to give some more visuals i'm just going to do new day equals false so this is going to be set to false on every new bar but then when we have a daily time frame change, I'm going to set new day equal to true. And I'm going to change the background color of that point in time just to highlight the fact that the time frame did change. And TradingView has a built-in function called BG color. And so I can just make this a conditional statement. So if new day is equal to true, and I can just put a question mark here, then I'm just going to do this blue color with half transparency. Otherwise, I'm going to put no color. So I'm going to save, I'm going to add it to my chart, and you can see this blue color on every day at 6 o'clock p.m. I'm on NQ Futures, so that is when a new day begins, and if I scroll back all the way, you can see that these are plotting in the past as well. So all those blue lines denote a new day. And we can also see visually how our counter is incrementing by going in this loop and doing label.new, and I set it to the current bar index whenever we change time frames. I'm just going to put it to be located on the current bars high and for text I'm just going to plot what our current count value is but it is a number so we need to str.to string to convert the number to a string and I'm just going to pass in the value of count and I'm just going to make sure the text color is white if I save that now I can see how the count is incrementing over time so you can see that on each instance of this blue line which indicates a new daily bar being formed we are incrementing the counter by one so 212, 213, 214, and so on. And then for the table to display this, I'm just gonna say if bar state dot is last, and this is so we're not running these calculations on every bar since we only care about the most recent state of the count variable. I'm gonna do var table is equal to table dot new. I'm gonna do position dot middle right. Just gonna set some random number for columns and rows since we only need one cell, so it doesn't really matter. Background color, you can do this chart dot bg color. For frame color, you can do chart.fg color. This is just to make it the, the most contrasting to your current background. Frame width, I'm gonna do two. Border color, bg color again. Border width of one. And I'm just gonna do table.cell. I'm gonna put the zero with column and the zero with row. And I'm just gonna do the same thing here. So str to two string count. I'm gonna save this. And I'm actually gonna add a little text before this to say days and then plus this value so we can see that the number of days is equal to count. And you can see that it plots it here with the most recent value. So on a very basic level, that is a very easy way to collect some form of data. 
basically where you're counting the number of instances that occurred. And in this case, I'm counting how many times we had a daily time frame change. But we can make this a little more challenging by trying to track inside bars and how often they take their high or low. So I'm going to do a couple things here. I'm going to initiate a count up and a count down, which by the way, if you want to just copy a line really quickly, at least on Windows, you can do shift alt and down or shift alt and up. Shout out to two degrees for that tip. And I'm going to declare a couple more here just for inside bar up equals zero and inside bar down equals zero. And then instead of new day, I am going to track these inside up occurrences and the inside down occurrences. And I'll explain this a little bit. So basically what I'm setting this up to do is to count how many times we have an inside bar whose close is above the open. That is what this count up is going to be. And how many times we have an inside bar that closes down. And from this, I'm going to track how many times we have an inside bar up that takes the high or how many times we have an inside bar down that takes the low right after it. So my condition here, instead of being timeframe.change, is just going to be to define an inside bar. So I'm just going to say high is less than or equal to the previous high and low is greater than or equal to the previous low. And I'm just going to remove all of this for now. So this is our condition for an inside bar. Now we just want to check if the close is greater than the open so that we can attribute it to inside bar up or inside bar down. So basically if close is greater than the open, I'm going to do inside bar up plus equals one. And I'm also going to do this inside up that we set right here. I'm going to set that to true. Reason being when we're checking the following bar to see if it took the previous high or low, this is just going to make it a little easier to see when we should be checking that condition. Otherwise, if the close is less than the open, I want to increase inside bar down by one. And I'm going to set inside down to true. And now for our background color, just to see what this looks like on the chart, I'm just going to pass in that we can either have inside up or inside down. That way, any inside bar, regardless of its state, will still be colored blue in the background, similar to what we did before. And I'm just going to comment this stuff out for now, just so we can see what the inside bar detection looks like. And you can see all the instances here in blue. For example, this bar's high is less than the previous bar's high, and its low is greater than the previous low. Same for this one, and this one, and this one as well. So now that we can detect those inside bars, we want to see if their highs or lows were taken, depending on if they closed up or down. So I'm going to say if we had that inside up condition from one bar ago, again, because we're on the following bar after the inside bar has formed, and we have taken the high from one bar ago, which is the high of the inside bar, then I'm going to finally increment this count up value, which is being used to track how many times we take that high. So I'm going to count up plus equals one. I'm going to copy that for the other condition and do if inside down from one bar ago and the low is less than the previous low, then I'm going to do count down plus equals one. And now I'm going to uncomment the table stuff. So I'm going to try to format this a little nicer than the previous one. So I'm going to do first and foremost table.cell and I'm basically going to have my table headers that don't change. So I'm going to do column one row zero and I'm going to have a column for count. So count how many times we have an inside bar up or an inside bar down. I'm going to make another column for taken. So if we have an inside bar up and we take the high or if we have an inside bar down and we take the low. And then lastly, I'm just going to do our percent value, which is just going to be basically how many times we took the inside bar extremes divided by the number of instances that we had. Then I also just want to make the labels for the inside bar up and down. So I'm going to do column zero, row one, do inside up, and then column zero, row two, inside down. And I'm going to save this so you can see what it looks like. So that is what we have right now where we defined count taken and percent as columns one two and three again we're starting with the zero with index width table so it's going to be the second third and fourth columns and then i have my row headers for inside up and inside down at row index one and two respectively so zero one and two so now we can just fill in everything else in here so we'll fill in the inside up stuff first so table dot cell now I know I want to be in the count column because I'm displaying how many times we had an inside bar that closed above its open. So I'm going to do column one and row one and do str.toString ib up. And if I save that, you can see we're displaying our count in here. 
So I'm just going to copy that and change it to row two. And here I'm going to display how many times we took that inside bar ups high. So I know I can display the count up variable since that's what's tracking that condition up here. So if I save that, you can see I'm filling it in. So 310 out of 410 instances took the previous inside bars high. Then if I do one more here, change it to column three, str.2 string, count up divided by inside bar up times 100. And this is basically going to give us the percentage of instances that took the previous inside bars high. So if I save that, you can see that displays correctly with about 75%. And say I want to get rid of these trailing digits, I can just do wrap this all in a parentheses and do math.round comma however many digits we want to keep i'll just do one so if i save that then there we go it's 75.6 percent so we basically just need to do the same exact thing for the inside down row so i can copy everything here and do a paste and i'm just going to change all these rows from one to two since that is the inside down row right here and change everything accordingly so instead of inside bar up there's going to be inside bar down there's going to be countdown and countdown divided by inside bar down. And if I save that, then we can see everything here. So how to read this table, we had 410 instances of inside bars that closed above their open. Of those 410 instances, 310 took the high on the following bar, which is 75% of the total instances that we found. And for inside bars that closed below their open, we had 298 instances of that on this particular chart. 206 of which took the low on the following bar or 69 percent of the total sample size and you can see how that obviously changes with different time frames since you'll have different data to work with on each one and obviously you can make this criteria a little more specific so for example if if i wanted to make sure that not only did the following bar take the inside bars high but it did not take the inside bars low then i can say and low is greater than the low of the previous bar and similarly for the other condition, high is less than the high of the previous bar. So I didn't save anything yet. Looking at the data, it's 75% and 69%. If I save it now, it changes to 49% and 47%, which is a huge difference. So obviously there were a good chunk of instances that took both sides of the inside bar, which makes sense. Obviously when you have a small range like that, it happened right here, actually, where this was defined as an inside bar. High is lower than the previous high, low greater than the previous low. Took the high and took the low as well. So again, this is pretty much just the general framework that I use for collecting data with PineScript, where I have my variables where I'm trying to store how many times a specific instance occurred. And, you know, sometimes I, I'll have these wrapped up in, in types and, and other stuff, but that could be another video for a later date. But once you have those counters, you basically just feed in your conditions, if this, then that, and increment your stuff accordingly. And then at the very end, you can take the number of successful instances over the number of total instances to get some reasonable data to look at on your chart. And for those who are familiar with my T-Trades daily bias indicator, which is all open source, that's basically all I'm doing. It's probably overwhelming to look at if you haven't really coded much, but if you go into this update lines method, this is basically where I'm tracking all my stats. So for those that don't know, this is what the T-Trades daily bias comes with. It's this little table that checks to see if the bias is previous day high or previous day low based on some rules set by T-Trades and determines the success rate of how often price takes the previous day high or previous day low with that bias. So what I'm doing here is basically checking if we took the previous day's high and our bias was already bullish, then we're going to increment the number of times that we hit the previous high. And that's ultimately going to be formatted into our table of how often price reached the previous high when our bias was pointed in that direction and vice versa for the lows as well. If we took the previous day low and our bias was already bearish, then we would increment the number of times that we hit the previous day low and use that to format our table. But that's pretty much it. Hopefully this was helpful. It's definitely a lot easier for me to crank out videos in PineScript versus NindaScript just because I'm more familiar and it takes me less time to, to make everything. So if you want to see more of these, please let me know. I'll probably still be doing a fair split of PineScript and Ninja, but if there is more demand for PineScript in the end, then I can ultimately tailor my videos towards that for sure. So if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Let me know what you want to see next, and I'll see you next time.